Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. And today we're going to go on a little bit different rabbit hole. We're going to talk about the Logos or Logos. I've heard it pronounced multiple ways. I had a previous episode where I've talked about something called the Law of One. Check out those episodes. And I've used the word Logos and I've been told it's Logos, but I'm going to use Logos, but it could be both. I really wanted to dedicate an episode to talk about the Logos, the Logos in our cosmic universe and how we play a part. Check out previous episodes by Aaron Abke where he discusses the law of one and he discusses how the universe is made and how the universe is put together. And check out my episode where I give a brief summary of the law of one. Now, if you don't know what the law of one is, the law of one is also referred to as the raw material. The material is a collection of channeled works created in 1981 to 1984. Carla Ruckert being the one that was channeling an entity called Ra, a high level sixth density being a social memory complex with vast knowledge of the universe that basically only answered questions by a researcher named Don Elkins. And you can get all the information that you want from Law of One Info. It dis- explores the way that our universe came together, the how we are all just one thought, and then goes into a discussion of consciousness, levels of consciousness, and the way the universe came together. One of the most fascinating aspects of the Law of One is the Logos or Logos. The Law of One material breaks down levels of consciousness going all the way from the bacteria, the molecule to animals, to advances in consciousness and higher evolutionary beings, such as humans and beyond like angels and gods. Now, the thing that really fascinates me that I can't get out of my mind that has tickled my brain since I've accessed this material is the Logos. When you read the law of one, you become aware that the earth is a conscious entity, that all of the planets, essentially most of the planets are conscious entities. And that the sun is a living conscious entity. And so the law of one really explained these levels of consciousness. And there is an organization to the universe. Galaxies are conscious living beings. They are aspects of intelligent infinity broken down and they're completely consciousness with their own free will. So our sun has its own free will to do whatever it wants and is on such a higher level of vibration and power. It creates all these planets and each of these planets have their own free will. Free will being a part of the solar system and this aspect of this universe. And so the sun has this solar system like this big gigantic play box, playground, and it's created over billions of years, more than one species, more than one intelligent being that are conscious. When you watch the law of one or listen to the law of one or read the books, you will learn of a history of the solar system. There was a conscious civilization of beings on the planet Venus that becomes Ra. And that civilizations move into something called social memory complexes, advanced living entities that are, a comp- that are comprised of multiple individualized conscious entities working as a single group or unit, unified. And it seems like this is something that's part of the evolution of the universe. So this is something that has just fascinated me. You've, you've seen other episodes where I've talked about the Logos. Because when you look up in the sky and you see all these stars, don't you just wonder what's really going on? Isn't it that question that tickles your brain every time? When you watch science fiction or watch Star Wars or Star Trek, or you imagine aliens and extraterrestrial species, this vast, amazing universe that we're looking at, don't you just wonder what's really going on? We know and feel like there's a genuine authenticity to the idea that there's an all-powerful being that may have created our universe when we say the word God. But there's obviously a lot more to it. We would have no idea or understanding of what it truly is. So the law of one material was fascinating, but my eyes were opened up 
when I recently read a book called The Cosmic Doctrine by Dion Fortune. Dion Fortune is an absolutely fantastic metaphysical writer, and her name keeps on coming up. When I was doing an interview um, Into the Void uh, on a radio station in Alabama, a really good show, and then I was also talking with Aaron Tomlinson, and we both they both had brought up this author, Dion Fortune. Dion Fortune is a, a classic writer that wrote about the occult that has a famous book called psychic self-defense which is a set of ways to defend yourself psychically from outside entities and your mind the unfortunate wrote about the kabbalah and then dabbled a little bit in channeling she was very hesitant and didn't even believe herself but had learned how to channel and questioned it to a degree that gave it some level of authenticity and consistency uh so she w attempted to ascend and attempted to channel masters or an ascended masters and in the process a a had a channeling for something called the cosmic doctrine and the cosmic doctrine explains the order of the universe the creation of the logos and how these logos interact and what they are so i wanted to combine these two and i'm going to do some readings from the cosmic doctrine and I'm going to do some readings from the Law of One. And I want to imagine so that we can get a better understanding of this incredible universe that we live in. There's much more to it. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about the Law of One and what they say about the Logos. So I have some readings in all, and I might not go through all of them, but I will definitely go through a good chunk of them. Uh, they're all around when I just type in a search word for Logos or Logos. Now, you may have first heard of the Logos. In the beginning was the Logos or Logos in the Bible, which is attributed as a line in the Bible. And many people have interpreted that as a word or thought. So in, in many ways, the Logos is a part of a, one single individual thought that is the creation of the universe. But there are levels to it. When you search for Logos in Law of One, you get this in order of its reference. So the first question was, they were talking about the creation of the universe. And Ra's explaining, awareness led to the focus of infinity into infinite energy. You have called this by various vibrational sound complexes. The most common to your ears being Logos or love. The creator is focusing of infinity as an aware or conscious principle called by us as closely as we can create understanding learning in your language intelligent infinity then they ask could you tell me about this first density of planetary entities Ra explains each step recapitulates intelligent infinity in its discovery of awareness in a planetary environment all begins in what you would call chaos energy undirected and random in its infinity slowly in your terms of understanding there forms a focus of self-awareness thus the logos moves light comes to form the darkness according to the co-creators patterns and vibratory rhythms so constructing a certain type of experience this begins with first density, which is the density of consciousness, the mineral and water life upon the planet, learning from fire and wind, the awareness of being. This is the first density. Another question. Well, in yesterday's material, you stated we offer the law of one, the solving of paradoxes. You also mentioned earlier in the first paradox or the first distortion I meant was the distortion of free will. Could you tell me if there's a sequence? Is there a first, second, third, fourth distortion of the law of one? Ra explains only up to a very short point. After this point, the manyness of distortions are equal one to another. The first distortion, free will, finds focus. This is the second distortion known to you as Logos, the creative principle or love. This intelligent energy thus creates a distortion known as light. From these the three distortions come many, many hierarchies of distortions, each having its own paradoxes to be synthesized, no one being more important than another. Question. Basically, I would say that to infringe on the free will of another self or another entity would be the first basic thing never to do under the law of one. Can you state any other breaking of the law of one than this basic rule? 
Ra explains, as one proceeds from the primal distortion of free will, one proceeds to understanding of the focal points of intelligent energy which have created the intelligences or ways of a particular mind-body-spirit complex in its environment, both what you call natural and what you call man-made. Thus, the distortions to be avoided are those which do not take into consideration the distortions of focus, energy, love, light, or shall we say logos, of this particular sphere or density. These include lack of understanding, the needs of the natural environment, the needs of other selves, mind-body-spirit complexes. These are many due to the various distortions of man-made complexes in which the intelligence and awareness of entities themselves have chosen a way of using the energies available. Thus, what would be an improper distortion with one entity is proper with another. We can suggest an attempt to become aware of the other self as self and thus do that action which is needed by other self. Understanding from the other self's intelligence and awareness. In many cases, this does not involve breaking the distortion of free will into a distortion or fragmentation called infringement. However, it is a delicate matter to be of service and compassion, sensitivity, and ability to empathize are helpful in avoiding the distortions of man-made intelligence and awareness. The area or arena called the societal complex is an arena in which there are no particular needs for care, for it is the prerogative, honor, duty of those in the particular planetary sphere to act according to its free will for the attempted aid of the social complex. Thus, you have two simple directives, awareness of the intelligent energy expressed in nature, awareness of the intelligent energy expressed in self to be shared when it seems appropriate by the entity of the social complex. And you have one infinitely subtle and various set of distortions of which you may be aware. That is distortions with respect to self and other selves, not concerning free will, but concerning harmonious relationships and service to others as others would almost benefit. The, um, in another question, they say, this seems to be a carefully planned or engineered stage of development. Can you tell me anything of the origin of this plan of development? Ra explains, we go back to the previous information. Consider and remember the discussion of the Logos. With the primal distortion of free will, each ga galaxy developed its own Logos. This Logos has complete free will in determining the paths of intelligent energy which promote the lessons of each of the densities given the conditions of the planetary spheres and the sun bodies. Question. I be, may be backtracking a little bit and make a few false starts because I think that are possibly the most important part of what you're try doing and trying to make it apparent through questioning how everything is one and how it comes from one intelligent infinity. This is difficult for me to do. So please bear with my errors in questioning. The concept I have right now is a process using both way what you have told me and some of Dewey Larson's material having to do with physics of the process. I have the concept that intelligent infinity expands outward from all locations everywhere. It expands outward in every direction uniformly like the surface of a balloon or a bubble expanding outward from every point everywhere. It expands outward at what's called unit velocity or the velocity of light. This is Larson's idea of the progression of what he calls space-time. Is this concept correct? This concept is incorrect, as in any concept of the one intelligent infinity. The concept is correct in the context of one particular logos, or love, or, or focus of this creator, which has chosen its, shall we say, natural laws and ways of expressing them mathematically and otherwise. The one undifferentiated intelligent infinity, unpolarized, full and whole, is the macrocosm of the mystery-clad being. We are messengers of the law of one. Unity at this approximation of understanding cannot be specified by any physics, but only by but activated or potentiated intelligent infinity due to the catalyst of free will. This may be difficult to accept. However, the understandings we have to share begin and end in mystery. So here we see that Ra says the word mystery, which Ra says multiple times, admitting not full knowledge of everything, but giving their best interpretation question. When does individualization or individualized portion of consciousness come into play? How does this individualization occur? And at what point does individualized consciousness take over in working on the basic light? Ra explains, you remain careful in the area of creation itself. In this process, we must further confuse you by stating that the process by which free will acts upon potential intelligent infinity to become focused intelligent energy takes place without the space-time of which you are so aware, as it is your continuum experience. The experience or existence of space-time comes into being after the individualization process of Logos or love has been completed and the physical universe, as you would call it, has coalesced or begun to draw inward while moving outward to the extent 
that that which you call upon your sun bodies have in their turn created timeless chaos coalescing into what you call planets. These vortices of intelligent energy spending a large amount of what you call first density in a timeless state. The space-time realization being one of the learned teachings of this density of beingness. Thus, we have difficulty answering your question with regard to time and space and the relationship to what you would call original creation, which is not part of the space-time as you can understand it. <laughs> Thank you. They ask, does a unit of consciousness, an individualized unit of consciousness, create, say, a unit of the creation? I will give an example. Would one individualized consciousness create one galaxy of stars? The type that has many millions of stars in it? Does this happen? This can happen. The possibilities are infinite. Thus, a Logos may create what you call a star system, or it may be the Logos creating billions of star systems. This is the cause of the confusion in the term galaxy. For there are many different Logos entities or creations, and we could call each using your sound vibration complex as a galaxy. So earlier and then later in the reading, when Ra is talking about galaxies, they refer to this solar system as a galaxy and then explaining because maybe they're more aware they, than what we, what we see. But these individualized units of galaxies or solar systems in the universe are all living entities. So the best way to consider it is our solar system altogether is a living entity. The sun is a living entity. And I will discuss further the implications of that. But the... Let's take an example, they ask. The planet that we are on now, tell me how much the creation was created by the same Logos that created this planet. Ra explains, this planetary Logos is a strong Logos, creating approximately 250 billion of your star systems for its creation. The, shall we say, laws or physical ways of this creation will remain, therefore, constant question then what you're saying is that the lenticular star system which we call a galaxy that we find ourselves in with approximately 250 billion other suns like our own was created by a single logos is this correct Ra explains this is correct now since there are many individualized portions of consciousness in this lenticular galaxy did this logos or logos then subdivide into more individualization of consciousness to create these consciousness or divide into these consciousness Ra explains, you are perceptive. This is also correct through an apparent paradox. Could you tell me what you mean by apparent paradox? Ra says, it would seem that if one Logos creates the intelligent energy ways for a large system, there would be not be the necessity or possibility of further sub-Logos differentiation. However, within limits, this is precisely the case, and it is perceptive that this has been seen. Question. Do all the individualized portions of the Logos then in our, I'll call the lenticular galaxy that we are in, 250 billion suns or stars, I call that major galaxy just so we will not get mixed up in our terms, does all the consciousness then in this individualized form that goes into what we are calling the major galaxy start out and go through all of the densities in order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then to 8? Or is there, shall I say, some who start higher up the rank and go in so that it is a mixture of intelligent consciousness in the galaxy? The latter is more nearly correct, Ross says. In each beginning, there is the beginning from infinite strength. Free will acts as a catalyst. Beings be begin to form the universe. Consciousness then begins to have the potential to experience. The potentials of experience are created as part of intelligent energy and are fixed before experience begins. However, there's always due to free will acting infinitely upon the creation, a great variation in initial responses to intelligent energy's potential. Thus, almost immediately the foundations of the, shall we call it, hierarchical nature of beings begins to manifest as some portions of consciousness, of awareness, through the experience in a much more efficient manner. Now, as, as they're describing this, you start to see when I, I read all of these lectures by Neville Goddard, Neville Goddard's primary assertion is that God is imagination. And each of these 
individualized portions of her concept uh, of consciousness are formations of imagination and all are given the power of imagination and each of them can imagine their own star systems that can imagine their own species and it's levels of imagination that start to blow your mind when you really take this stuff into consideration question i'm assuming the process of creation then after the original creation of the major galaxy is continued by the further individualization of consciousness of the logos so that there are many many portions of individualized consciousness then creating further items you might say for experience all over the galaxy is this correct this is correct for within the shall we say guidelines or ways of the logos the sub logos may find various meanings differentiating the experiences without removing or adding to these ways question is our sun this planetary system as we know it a sub logos or the physical manifestation of a sub logos this is correct then i am assuming this sub logos created the planetary system in all of its densities is this correct this is incorrect, Ross says. The sublogos of your solar entity differentiated some experiential components within the patterns of intelligent energy set in motion by the logos, which created the basic conditions and vibratory rates consistent throughout your, what you have called, major galaxy. Then, is this sublogos, which is our sun, the same sublogos, but just manifesting in different parts through the galaxy, which is, is it all the stars in this galaxy? Please restate, Ross says. What I'm saying is there are roughly 250 billion stars or suns, something like ours in this major galaxy. Are they all a part of the same sub-logos? They are all a part of the same logos. Your solar system, as you call it, is a manifestation somewhat and slightly different due to the presence of a sub-logos. Now, all of these, let, let me be sure I'm right then, then our sun is a sub-logos of the logos that that is the major galactic logos correct that this is correct are there any sub sub logos that are found in our planetary system that are logos that are sub to our sun this is correct would you tell me that one of those would you give me an example of one of those i'll call sub sub logos one example is your mind body spirit complex ross says then every entity that exists would be some type of sub or sub sub logos is this correct this is correct down to the limits of any observation for the entire creation is alive. Question, then the planet which we walk upon here would be some form of sub-sub-logos. Is that correct? A planetary entity is so named only as logos if it is working in harmonic fashion with entities of mind-body complexes upon its surface or within its electromagnetic field. So this seems to imply it, that the planet is a logos only if it has life on it question do, do the sub logos such as our sun do any of them in our major galaxy do they have a metaphysical polarity shall we say positive or negative as we've been using the term as you use the term this is not so entities through the level of planetary have the strength of intelligent infinity through the use of free will going through the actions of beingness the polarity is not thusly as you understand polarity it is only when the planetary sphere begins harmonically interacting with mind body complexes and more especially mind body spirit complexes that planetary spheres take on distortions due to the thought complexes of entities interacting with the planetary entity the creation of the one infinite creator does not have the polarity you speak of thank you Yesterday, you stated that planets in first density are in a timeless state to begin with. Can you tell me how the effect we appreciate as time comes into a being? Ra explains, we have just described to the, the state of beingness of each Logos. The processes by which space-time comes into continuum form a function of the careful building, shall we say, of an entire or whole plan of vibratory rates, densities, and potentials. When this plan has coalesced in the thought complexes of love, then the physical manifestations begin to appear, the first manifestation stage being awareness or consciousness. At the point at which the coalescence is at the livingness or beingness point, the point or fountainhead of beginning space-time then begins to unroll its scroll of livingness. Then the con Continued application of love. I will assume this is directed by a sublogos or a sub sub logos. This continued application of love creates rotations of these vibrations, which in discrete units of angular velocity. This then creates a chemical elements in our physical illusion 
and I will assume the elements in the other or what we call non-physical or other densities in the illusion is this correct? Ra explains the Logos creates all densities. Your question was unclear, however, we shall state the Logos does create both the space-time densities and the accompanying time-space densities. Question. I guess what we'd better get that is we have traced the path of creation at least down to the crystalline structure. We'd better concentrate on the evolution of thought and its seeking path to intelligent infinity. We have created in the major galaxy of the Logos a very large number of planets. As these planets develop, is it possible for you to give me an example of various planetary developments in what I would call a metaphysical sense having to do with development of consciousness and its polarities through the galaxy? In other words, I believe that some of these planets develop quite rapidly into higher density planets and some take longer times. Can you give me some sort of idea of that development? Ra explains, this particular Logos of your major galaxy has used a large portion of its coalesced material to reflect the beingness of the Creator. In this way, there is much of your galactic system which does not have the progression of which you speak but dwells spiritually as a portion of the Logos. Of these entities upon which consciousness dwells, there is, as you surmise, a variety of space-time periods during which the higher densities of experience are attained by consciousness. Does this fulfill the requirements of your query? I'm going to make a statement and let you correct if I've made errors. This is the statement. Creation is a single entity or unity. If only a single entity exists, then the only concept of service is to service to self. If this single entity subdivides, then the concept of service of one of its parts to the other part is born. From this concept springs the equality of service to self or to others. It would seem that as the Logos subdivided, parts would see, select each orientation as individualized entities emerge in space-time, then I would assume that they have polarity. And is this statement correct? <clears throat> This statement is quite perceptive and correct, Ross says, until the final phase in which we note the polarities begin to be explored only at the point when a third density entity becomes aware of the possibility of choice between the concept of distortion of service to self or service to others. This marks the end of what you may call the unselfconscious or innocent phase of conscious awareness. Question. Can you give me a brief history of the metaphysical principles of the development of each of our planets around the sun and their function with respect to the evolution of beings? Ra then explains, we shall give you a metaphysical description only of those planets upon which individual mind-body-spirit complexes have been, are, or shall be experienced. You may understand the other spheres to be part of the Logos. So this means that not all of the planets have had life or have become as uh, at the same level of density. Um, and I found this passage very interesting. Ross says, we, we take that one known as Venus. This planetary sphere was one of rapid evolution. It is our native earth and the rapidity of the progress of the mind, body, spirit complexes upon its surface was due to harmonious interaction. Upon the entity known to you as Mars, as you have already discussed, this entity was stopped in mid-third density, thus being unable to continue in progression due to the lack of hospitable conditions upon the surface. This planet shall be undergoing healing for some of your space-time millennia. The planet which you dwell upon has a metaphysical history, that's Earth, well known to you and may ask about it if you wish. However, if we have spoken to a great degree upon this subject, the planet known as Saturn, has a great affinity for the infinite intelligence and thus has been dwelled upon in its magnetic fields of time and space by those who wish to protect your system. The planetary entity known to you as Uranus is slowly moving through the first density and has the potential of moving through all the densities. Question. Thank you. I was wondering if any of the other planets had a metaphysical evolution. You stated yesterday that much of this major galactic system dwells spiritually as part of the Logos, but do you mean that near the center of this major galactic system that the stars there do not have planetary systems? Is this correct? This is incorrect. The Logos has distributed itself throughout your galactic system. However, the time-space continuum of some of your central sun systems is much further advanced. Question. I'm trying to make a simple model of the portion of the universe we find ourselves in. Starting with the Logos or Sub-Logos, our sun, we have white light emanating from this. 
This is made up of frequencies ranging from the red to the violet. I am assuming that this white light then contains the experiences through all of the densities. And as we go into the eighth density, we go into a black hole, which emerges on the other side as another Logos or sun and starts another octave of experience. Can you comment on this part of my statement? Ra explains, we can comment upon the statement to an extent. The concept of the white light of the sublogos being prismatically separated and later at the final chapter being absorbed again is basically correct. However, there are subtleties involved which are more than semantic. The white light which emanates and forms the articulated sublogos has its beginning in what may be metaphysically seen as darkness. The light comes into that darkness and transfigures it, causing the chaos to organize and become reflective or radiant. Thus the dimensions come into being. Conversely, the blackness of the black hole, metaphysically speaking, is a concentration of white light being systematically absorbed once again into the one creator. Finally, this absorption into the one creator continues until all the infinity of creations have attained sufficient spiritual mass in order that all form once again the great central sun if you would so imagine it, of the intelligent infinity awaiting potentiation by free will. Thus the transition of the octave is process which may be seen to enter into timeliness of a unimaginable nature. To attempt to measure it by your time measures would be useless. Therefore the concept of moving through the black hole of the ultimate spiritual gravity well and coming immediately into the next octave misses the subconcept or corollary of the portion of this process which is timeless question in trying to build an understanding of from the start you might starting with the intelligent infinity and getting to our present condition of being i'm having some difficulty but i think i should go back to the investing our sun since it is the sub logos that created all that we experience in this particular planetary system will you give me a description of the sun of our sun ross says this is a query which is not easily answered in your language for the sun has various aspects in relation to intelligent infinity to intelligent energy and to each density of each planet as you call these spheres moreover these differences extend into the metaphysical or time space part of your creation in relationship to intelligent infinity the sun body is equally with all parts of the infinite creation part of that infinity in relation to the potentiated intelligent infinity, which makes use of intelligent energy, it is the offspring, shall we say, of the Logos, for a much larger number of sublogi. The relationship is hierarchical in that sublogos uses the intelligent energy in ways set forth by the Logos and uses its free will to co-create the, shall we say, full nuances of your densities as you experience them. In relationship to the densities, the sun body may physically, as you would say, be seen to be a large body of gaseous elements undergoing the processes of fusion and radiating heat and light. Metaphysically, the sun achieves a meaning to fourth through seventh density according to the growing abilities of entities in these densities to grasp the living creation and co-entity or other self nature of this sun body. Thus by the sixth density the sun may be visited and inhabited by those dwelling in time space and may even be partially created from moment to moment by the processes of six density entities in their evolution. This explanation that's given by Ra that, that beings live inside the sun is confirmed by Dolores Cannon in her book, Convoluted Universe. In the final chapter of the Convoluted Universe, Dolores Cannon discusses the God Source. Now, if you don't know who Dolores Cannon is, in a similar situation, she was a master hypnotist that developed QHHT and spoke with many different entities similar to Ra higher selves, different beings, when inducing people into a, an exploration of their previous lives, she was able to get similar information. For instance, one being asks, we can go into the sun. That's where I feel comfortable and familiar. Dolores says, in the sun, in the sun with the light. I'm part of it. It's just one big light and it's hot. Our sun, or is it something similar? It's the sun. Dolores says, it is the sun. Well, what? What's it like to be part of that? Normal. It feels home. I don't have a body. I, I do have consciousness. I'm part of the whole thing and not separate. A part of the whole light? Well, what is it like to be in the sun? 
The entity says, as you approach it, it's extremely bright and hot. But as you go into it, it's not hot anymore. Once you become it, it's just a ball of light with consciousness. The sun has consciousness too. Yeah, it's a larger consciousness. It goes on and on forever. But aren't there many suns in many places? Not like this. This, there's just one. This is different than a star that, that is a sun? Is that what you mean? Yes, it's pure energy, Dolores said. Because there are many suns, aren't there with many planets orbiting around them? I don't know. All I know is that I went towards this ball of light. I recognized as soon as I knew it, I was my, it was my home. And when I went to, into it, I didn't have a form. I just had total consciousness and energy. So you feel like that is your home and that's where you are comfortable? Where everything is good? It feels normal. Had you been there a long time or do you know? I don't know, but I recognize it's who I am. <clears throat> so we may go into that some more, but we already have confirmation from another entity that are, there are living sources in the sun. So now, of course, when I look up into the sun, I meditate in the sun. I regularly try to go out and do my meditations in the sun. I sun gaze. I try everything with the sun. The sun is, and I pray and talk to the sun now, of course, in my own privacy. <laughs> but I found this interesting. <clears throat> and, and of course, the idea of the Logos has just been tickling my brain in a significant way for a very long time. And I've continued to think about it. If you check out my meditation on becoming intelligent infinity, uh, I try to go into the headspace of becoming one of these Logos. So, I was really excited when I found the Cosmic Doctrine by Dion Fortune, where she discusses the, the Logos even further. Now there's the question, maybe, maybe Don Elkins or Carla Ruckert had read this before, and that's why we're getting this information in the Law of One, proving that it's not channeled. And hey, I don't know if that's true or not, but there is some proof that Don Elkins didn't know what was being channeled. Uh, because some of the questions he didn't agree with and, and parts of it were, were not released. And uh, there's further discussion on that if you do research on the law of one. <clears throat> but it's really interesting. Let me give you a basic review of the cosmic doctrine. I, I thought about doing it separately as, a, as an entire episode, but I just wanted to really build this in. The cosmic doctrine channeled by Dion Fortune who had little faith in channeling and had great difficulty in understanding the material. The text asserts that our universe is the creation of a much more ancient order of being referred to as the Logos. And the first section of the doctrine begins with a description of the physics of their world, which are quite different from ours. The alien situation is clearly explained, but hard to grasp because it is unrelated to anything that we know. Indeed, most people find the physics of our own world difficult to understand. So the physics of an alien world is even more so. The forces with, which shaped the evolution of these ancient beings is described in this book. The paradigm of competition for limited resources does not exist there. Life is non-Darwinian. There are no species, no reproduction, and no death. Each being evolves individually from the simplest, most primitive form, or much more often does not evolve and remain simple. In most rare cases, a being attains consciousness, a sort of enlightenment. Such a conscious being can, with difficulty, organize simpler beings to form a huge body, like a social memory complex, or it is like a human body with, hu with its cells, but the simpler beings can still leave and continue their independent life. One such organization created our solar system, according to the, this channeled work, and closely monitors its progress. The second section of this book describes how this is organized. It is an extreme form of nanotechnology. A horde of tiny beings are created, which in turn create yet tinier versions of themselves, which in turn create yet tinier versions and so forth. And in the end, seven layers of nano exist within our world at the seventh tiniest layer. It is like building a ship in a bottle in that tiny ship is a tiny ship in which yet a smaller ship is built and so forth seven times. And why do they do this? The ancient beings are immortal and are motivated by learning and growth. Stagnation is the danger. They have done everything there is to do in their world. Miniature worlds such as ours are created as a means of for further challenges with their consequent learning and growth. So what we see as suns and stars and solar systems is a part of a nano 
It seems that such beings do not reproduce or have family. So creations are their progeny. And each of the members of the tiny world was created by being in the greater world. We can never leave and our existence ends according to this book with the end of the solar system. We are just a part of the living solar system, but our memories persist and will be absorbed by that being. Events pass much more rapidly, 25,000 times faster in our world. So learning takes place much more quickly in our tiny world. It is my feeling after reading this that we are being led on a journey or path to an evolution of our own Logos in which we can eventually, through social memory complex, obtain the same order as these beings, becoming suns, solar system, planets, galaxies, and behind our own black hole, creating our own universe. That is what I have had dreams of, visions of continuously, that we are being taken on this process. We're harvested from this planet as beings that can be taken to the next level. In each density, we grow to a greater refined understanding of creation and thought, which eventually leads us to becoming the ultimate Logos. And that's what we become when we advance to the higher level beyond our own solar system, which I find super fascinating. The third section of the book is all about how this relates to us as humans. And it's hard for me to understand. Uh, and the fourth is, is also about the laws and how different laws and how they are, they affect the universe. Uh, there's, there's a couple introductions. They're kind of trivial. Um, and so the question is, as I ask with the law of one, is it real or a delusion? Fortune herself was unsure and felt it should be put to the test somehow. I find this remarkably self-consistent with the law of one and once in self-consistent and once we can grasp the alien concept and, and peculiar vocabulary very similar to the law of one fiction is never anywhere near this complex and imaginative and admittedly it's difficult in all of these writings to gauge and rate what this stuff means because it claims are either true or false in certain respects which is very difficult to check. Regardless, there are some very interesting and cogent chapters in the cosmic doctrine that really made me think in the same ways that I thought when I read the law of one, a lot of it was the reminiscent of the kind of content one would find in Steiner's evolutionary descriptions in outline of the occult sciences. Just that this reading like the law of one zooms out to the more macro and attempts to explain the entire cosmos, the universe of universes. It follows the trail of simplicity to secondary and tertiary causes to where increasing layers of ripples and interference patterns fill in to create the complexity that we experience when examining the world on any mystical level, or even in comparing the data of our world religions. One warning to, to anyone that's starting down this path and reading about this stuff, as I have shown you from reading the law of one, the terminology can be very off putting. And there are, are certainly people that have already turned off this video because 25 to 30% of what I'm saying doesn't make sense. And the words are sometimes antiquated, defunct, and it's hard to understand. And it's hard to cram all of this information into what we know. So, if you start reading and discussing this material as a conversation on astrophysics, this will really dig at you. At the same time, I read it, the more warnings of Dion Fortune herself became clear that the channeling draws the best words and concepts available from her vocabulary, which is also what's happening with Carla Ruckert, and that ultimately the material presented is the best approximation of what they want to say, even if by analogy and the words that we are stuck with are the words that were in Carla Ruckert's brain or in the unfortunate's brain, and they still cannot fully explain it to us in a current way of thinking the seven circles of Dion Fortune's cosmology would be tantamount to claiming six universal shells within our sphere with something like a three ring gyroscopic force to the outside of us. She describes all of these competing forces as the beginnings of the universe. What caused me to, when I first read it, I, I couldn't understand it and I prejudged it and it seemed ridiculous. And I started to reconsider uh, what I had prejudged this book, even the law of one, I did the same. 
Um, it had to do with the solidity of what comes after the explanation of the universal structure, the laws. In particular, impaction was probably the best chapter. The law of limitation is a close second. Um, there are philosophical similarities that I see in the seven fears from Poimandris, as well as parallels to A.A. A. Bailey, parallels, parallels to Kabbalion. Uh, but similar to the theosophic literature, it seems to have something in common with respect to the involutionary arc preceding the evolutionary. And I can also see where the question is wide open as to whether this was channeled material or whether it was more of a subconscious firestorm. Regardless of what the source, when comparing theosophy, hermetic doctrine, and a lot of other mystical texts and channelings, a great deal rang true to type. It fits a fine specimen of occult work along these lines. The book and the books and readings itself in a very atomist or democratist way. And the questions occur as you read is that how it's properly read or was this strictly those commuting being Dion Fortune's mind or her subconscious simply letting using the best analogies available from her vocabulary and knowledge base. So I wanted to give some limited readings of what I found interesting. The book is broken apart and the first chapter is the first manifestation and it explains that knowledge falls into two divisions the record of facts and the explanation thereof knowledge can only consist of that which is present in the mind that which does not enter the mind cannot be known therefore you can only know that which you have senses to interpret to you as new senses open up more planes of existence can be known there is however a limit to the knowledge of the finite Perception ceases at the barrier of manifestation of that which lies beyond. We can only know by analogy. The unmanifest is pure existence. These images are not descriptive, but symbolic and are designed to train the mind, not inform it. Therefore, you may think the unmanifest as interstellar space and of the Logos as a sun surrounded by his solar system of planets and of the emanations of the Logos as rays. The unmanifest is only unity. Manifestation begins when duality occurs. The prime duality is space and movement. The first manifestation was current in space. The metaphor that the unfortunate uses may convey nothing to your mind, but that's what is talked about at the beginning. And that there's no such thing as a straight line in the cosmos all movement therefore has a slight curve in its projection therefore eventually it returns to the spot whence it started and forms a spinning ring now the prime movement is just flowing of space that returns after long aeons once it started and then renews its journey this sets up a spinning belt of enormous circumference this belt spins on one plane for immense aeons of time, spins with a changeless spinning, but its tendency is to communicate its motion to the space about it, which leads more to the space to flow into the spinning. That's just the first chapter. There is the second chapter, the, the first Trinity, and it's explained you have to conceive of the cosmos in its primal aspect, as Fortune explains, as consisting of three spinning movements, all that is nothing but movement in movement in space pure movement for the prime movement which gives rise to all that is commences before there is anything to move the cosmos then is bounded by the movement which is called the ring pass not but because the ring pass not there are movements in two directions there are the ring cosmos and the chaos good and evil they are the sources of the forces which are known to you by these names but through these forces influence that which is known as the ring pass not they cannot pass beyond it these three rings are why the supreme being is always conceived of as a trinity and three is the fundamental number everything in the end is reducible to these three influences whatever subsequent stresses arise may be analyzed into the balancing of these three forces a the force of the ring cosmos which tends towards the center b the force of the ring chaos which tends towards outer space and c the force of the ring past not which holds the balance between them and prevents either of these forces from going to extremes in another section of this chapter the channeled spirit says the prime activity is movement the second activity is light the third activity is sound the movement of the ring cosmos sets up secondary swirls within the area of its influence its tendency is to draw more and more space into its spin it cannot expend itself externally before it's limited by the sphere of the ring past not so when you're reading this it gets to be pretty 
difficult and you have to question whether it's important. We get a full explanation of the evolution. And then we go into section two and it's the evolution of the Logos. And they explain how these entities formed. And I found a lot of it incredibly interesting. Uh, it starts out from the traveling Adam moving up through all of these and explains that a universe is a thought form projected by the mind of God, the relation of the God of a universe to the cosmos, to the universe he has evolved, he is the, its creator and unconditioned and sustainer by it, finite, infinite, and omnipotent. It sounds familiar. Uh, there is a check, there's a section called the projection of the concept of the universe and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep according to Genesis 1-2. And as we've already seen, a great entity projects itself into concept of itself. This, however, is the be not the beginning of objectivization in a universe, though, dealt with first in the order of instruction in order to make that which follows more comprehensible for the great entity when it projects the image of itself found substance of the same nature as the projection, awaiting the organization which the projection would bring about. It sounds to me like the mirror is being talked about right there. There's a great chapter on the relation between a projected image and the Lagoidal consciousness. And I found this pretty interesting. It says at the beginning of an evolution, the, con the Logos is alone in that sphere, which is afterwards to become its universe. It is conscious only of itself, for there is no object in existence within that sphere of which it can be conscious. It sounds like God by himself. It will thus be seen that the Logos reverses the order of the psychologist concept of the evolution of consciousness, having first cosmic consciousness, then self-consciousness, then objective consciousness. The Logos then is now aware that the thought form has been projected from its consciousness into its aura. For under one aspect, the universe may be conceived as the aura of God. This consciousness of an object produces a re reaction in the logoidal consciousness. There is a subject-object adaptation, and this adaptation produces a corresponding modification in the reflected universe, which becomes capable of an object-subject reaction. Thus, a relationship or reciprocity is established between the logos, or great entity, and that projected image of the logoidal consciousness, which is the incipient universe. It must not be thought, however, that the logoidal consciousness is limited to awareness of its objectified universe. The logoidal focused consciousness or conscious consciousness is thus limited, for a focus or conscious consciousness can only be built up out of awareness of and reactions to objects. But the logoidal subconsciousness is aware of the cosmos and the consciousness is influenced by the subconsciousness, which is basis and background of the cosmic tides that ebb and flow, which move the circle of corresponding aspects of logoidal subconsciousness as stimulated by their influences. Now there is an implication that's given in the cosmic doctrine that these logos are at times sleeping and there is a subconscious to the logos. So there are periods, maybe 75,000 years where the Logos is sleeping and you see tides of history that is related to an awareness where it's like a dreamlike period. And then there's more active like period of the Logos, which I find fascinating, almost this duality between subconsciousness and consciousness that occurs even on the large scale of the whole universe, which I love. There's a section on auto reactions in cosmic memory. And it explains that each phase of evolution, whether cosmic or logoidal, starts with a new type of action or reaction. And every possible variation is worked out by adding the possibility of reaction to the reactions already established. So it gets a little bit complicated, but it, they explain it will thus be seen that the form or framework upon which the universe is built has been made the basis of a third type of manifestation, and that's created this auto-reaction. So you get this idea that the, the universe is sort of a clockwork, but once you start to analyze it, it does go to another level, and there is much more to it than just this clockwork. There is this consciousness. Uh, so Another fantastic reading from the Cosmic Doctrine is Evolution of the Lords of Flame, Form, and Mind. And in this one it says, The evolution of a divine spark, let it be noted to begin with, that the first swarm of divine sparks 
differs from its successor in many respects. To begin with, the first swarm is composed of tra the traveling atoms of the universe. Secondly, these divine sparks are subjected to no other influences than those of the Logos itself. Because satellites have, having not seen been developed, they are not exposed to the influences of the planetary spirits. Therefore, the sparks of the first swarm have the divine image impressed on them in all its purity, unblurred by other influences. There is an absence of cross currents in the influences of which they play upon the first swarm, which causes them to attain the divine ideal with much less stress and effort. So it's really talking about the beginning times. And it talks about the evolution of the first swarm is slowest because it's all original work, and then it just speeds up, and then there becomes a differentiation as you go on into different levels of personality with the Logos. There's a section on the influences of the regents upon the globes, and the evolution of the life swarm and the last section of the cosmic doctrine is worth reading it's talking about the different laws that play upon these logos but i could certainly go into this even further on both levels for both the law of one and the cosmic doctrine and the reason i'm talking about it is i i really don't know i'm just so excited and fascinated by this concept and Add it into your meditations. Imagine that you are this higher level Logos. If you're the sun or imagine that you're the planet. And I have found times when I was able to access this. That is all a part of our own wonderful human imagination that we are all of it. If we are God as described by Neville Goddard, then we are the Logos. We are just a differentiation of it keyed low in this life. And as we move towards these higher levels, we don't just become light and everything's bliss and everything's perfect. When we become and unsheath the, the body that we're in, we move up in levels and it's all this journey that we're going on. There's a reason that we're going through this life having forgotten everything else before because we are becoming gods we are becoming our own logos and each of the planets are doing the same we're all moving up in this incredible hierarchy now if you ever get a chance i recommend that you read the culture series by Ian banks i-a-i-n banks it's an exploration in fiction of the idea of advanced artificial intelligence living on scales like the logos what do these entities think about what do they do so there may be a point in the future when we have advanced entities develop from our own creations that are in the same level of respect as the logos but it's uh, pretty interesting i check i recommend that you check that out it's a science fiction series and they center on the culture a utopian post-scarcity space society of humanoids aliens and very advanced artificial intelligence living in socialist habitats spread across the milky way galaxy and the main theme is the dilemmas that an idealistic hyperpower faces in dealing with civilizations that do not share its ideals and i just found it interesting there's several um different novels and i recommend for instance the hydrogen sonata for in, in particular or accession which are discussions of these group these minds and the hydrogen sonata is way super advanced civilizations at some point do something called sublime which is essentially it sounds like a, another advancement of the law of one moving into the next density and it's like the whole civilization sublimes and they don't understand it so all these advanced intelligences watch as this civilization and this solar system becomes something else so i recommend that and it's been played around with in science fiction in so many levels but it's interesting because dion fortune's exploration of the logos miniaturizing itself onto nano levels and that that, that the, what we think of is even bigger and greater than the space in the solar system that we're in this is a miniature is uh, the idea of the many chlorians that is talked about in star wars but there is so much to discuss and it's wonderful to dream about and i would love to talk about it with you because it fascinates me i'm just craving right now to go out in the sun and fill myself up with this incredible power of the sun you know in the past there were sun gods and then current christian religions will say that how pagan it is it's so funny that there may be more realism in those past pagan religions than we realized so what is actually happening in the solar system and do you know more 
I also recommend that you check out Alice Bailey, who has a book called Initiation Human and Solar and The Light of the Soul and The Cosmic Fire, which are discussing initiations by the sun into a higher order, which I don't know if they're true or not, but that lights up my mind to think about this further. And what we're seeing with the sun and these planets may be something more that we don't even understand. Check out the series Initiation on Gaia. And he explains somebody that has accessed the Akashic records and has memories of being an advanced life form from previous planets. He explains that everything turns into a, the most advanced entities become circular because there are different geometries eventually becoming a curve and seems to also affirm the law of one. I still find confirmation from channeled works and other material to all of this stuff. So there is something to it or there's a grand myth being perpetrated, but in either case, it's something that I will continue to research and find more information about. What do you think? Do you sun gaze? Do you find communion when you look in the sun? What is your feelings about this? Do you have knowledge or other materials that you've read about that indicate what these logos are and how they work? I want to know. And I want a better understanding of this stuff because admittedly, I still don't understand. This is high level doctorate met metaphysical information that I still don't completely understand, but I am fascinated and I want to know. So please let me know what you think. I would love to read all of your comments to learn more. In any case, all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution. Well, well, welcome to the Reality Revolution. Unlimited possibilities. Dedicated to the spirits who believe life is meant to be magical. Get out. He has some really good meditations, and you discuss. It contains advanced viewpoints of the multidimensional human beings of the 21st century. I'm your host, Brian Scott. <laughs> Sometimes you need to go back. We were able to visualize with exploring stuff that's fun to explore. I can tell. Unleash your potential. Some topics on how to change the subconscious mind and some interesting. I'm your host, Brian Scott.